Hi, welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Scott Knutson, with, with a very special guest, best-selling author, Robin Hutton. And she wrote the book, Sergeant, Sergeant Reckless, America's War Horse. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Scott. It is a privilege and an honor to be here. It truly is. Oh, Robin, thank you for telling such an amazing story. I just love history and I love horses. And oh. you put them together. Well, listen, you know, you can't, this is such a great story. And the fact that you can't beat it because it's true, uh, it makes it all the better. And uh, I've just been very blessed to have this little horse in, uh, in my life. And uh, boy, she couldn't be more real to me if she was grazing in my backyard. So um, it's just been a wonderful ride, excuse the pun. <laughs> but uh, boy, this little pony has just uh, changed my life in ways I never could have imagined. That's so great. So what led you to Sergeant Reckless? What, what started the uh, passion? Well, I'll tell you the short story. And one time, I'll tell you the long story another when we have more time. But uh, I discovered her story in a book called Chicken Soup for the Horse Lover's Soul. I had, was having writer's block. I was working on another project. And I was having writer's block. And I pulled that book off of my bookshelf to get inspiration. And in there was the story of Reckless. And I'm like, well, who's this horse and why have I never heard about her? Because it was clearly the greatest horse story I had ever come across. And this was in 2006. And I Googled her name and only four things came up on the internet. She had vanished from the pages of history. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And and so uh, I did some research the first year. So it took me six years, uh, six, seven years to research and write the book and then a year to get it published. And uh, so it, it, because I had to track down the men that served with her and find them and get their pictures and get their personal stories. There really wasn't a lot out there in, um, uh, in the collective uh, uh, or the archives didn't even have a lot of information on her. So it's filled with their personal stories. But I actually wrote the script first because I thought this would make a heck of a movie, you know? I was thinking that. Oh my gosh, you know? So I wrote the script and this was in 2009. And just as I was getting ready to shop it, Steven Spielberg announces War Horse and I can't get a meeting in Hollywood. And I'm like, of course, Steven's, I thought he found my story, you know, and I'm, Scott, I am hyperventilating. Oh, I mean, no. I'm like, and I am, I am just pacing around my office thinking, oh my God, Steven's doing my movie, you know, but thankfully it was not my movie, but I still couldn't get a meeting. So I thought, okay, God, not on your, not, this is not your timetable. Let me fade back. Let me get my book written. Let me get a couple of monuments built. Let me show the world that this story is a great one and people hunger for this kind of story. And so um, now that the book's been out and I have five monuments to Reckless uh, around the country, I'm now gonna uh, work at uh, trying to get her movie done. And that's the next thing on my bucket list that I'm gonna put up on my vision tree. <laughs> awesome, that'd be great. I can see it being a movie. This is an incredible story. And just, just the tagline alone, she wasn't a horse, she was a Marine. Yeah. She's so yeah. very strong. And to see the, the uh, military, uh, what they say about her and the videos on, on, on those social media about how they feel. Yeah, about her, yeah. That's very strong. Yeah, it, it truly is. One of my favorite videos that is out there is, I uh, actually have it up on our Sergeant Reckless website, um, is from uh, Brigadier General Kevin Kalei. And he was the commanding general at Camp Pendleton when we de uh, dedicated the monument for Camp Pendleton. And boy, you know, he gets up there and he's standing in front of the monument and he's telling her story. And having a top brass Marine give, you know, the military lingo behind it, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, it just, it really is something special to watch. And uh, I just feel very, very blessed for all of the press that she gets. And especially like around the holidays, I, I always, I can tell by the orders I get in my store that her story had to post somewhere because all of a sudden people are really, you know, excited about her and want to uh, order things and, and learn more about her so it's really really cool wow once i hear the story you just you just have to learn more about her it's just so yeah. interesting it's such a great story so how did the marines come to find sergeant reckless how did that happen well you know it's interesting uh she was owned by uh, a young korean man called uh, named kim huck moon and actually kim was a jockey and he owned her dam 
And, um, and so when Reckless was born, the story goes that her dam died. And so he didn't, uh, he was very distraught. Um, uh, so he, he wasn't really connected with Reckless for the first year or so of her life. But one day he was at the Seoul racetrack and he saw her and reconnected with her. And um, this was before the war started. And uh, so he took her, he took her under his wing again. So he was going to race her is what he really wanted to do. She was born in 1948, but when the war broke out in 1950, racing was suspended. And so she became a cart horse. And, um, but he took such care of her. He made sure that the, her sores around her neck, you know, from, from, you know, hauling all of this stuff were taken care of. And he loved this horse. And so it was uh, in uh, uh, October of 1952 that there was a, a mission uh, with uh, the recoilless rifle platoon. That was the gun that she carried the ammunition for. And there was a uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, Eric Pedersen, who was the commanding officer of the recoilless rifle platoon, uh, saw what carrying those rounds of ammunition did to his men during this particular mission. And he was a horseman, and he uh, decided when he, he saw how hard it was to carry the gun up the hill and all of these rounds, each round weighed 24 pounds, and it was a big canister, quite a large canister. And so a man could only carry two, maybe three on his back if he was lucky and big. Uh, and he couldn't make that many trips up and down because that was a lot of weight for him to be carrying. And so it really wore out his men. So he got permission to go to, go to the Seoul racetrack and look for a pack animal. And he didn't care if it was a horse, a mule, whatever he could find. And uh, there he found uh, Reckless. And, and uh, in the book, it says when he saw her, she had the eye of an eagle, you know, and he, he said that she was just such a beautiful, dainty little thing. She's only like 13 hands high, um, and just over 13. And uh, we think that she is a Jeju pony mixed with a thoroughbred, and that's called a Halla horse. Oh. And um, the Halla horse, they do race in South Korea as well. So, uh, Lieutenant Peterson paid $250 of his own money to buy this horse for his men. And uh, the only reason Kim Huck Moon sold his beloved horse was to buy an artificial leg for his sister who lost hers in a landmine accident. And so his loss, his incredible loss, was the Marine Corps gain because, boy, what she did in these battles, there's no way to tell or to calculate the number of lives she saved just by the fact that she was able to carry so much ammunition and keep the guns so well supplied, even to the point of crystallizing on a couple of these missions, and uh, even carried wounded off the battlefield. So, um, you know, it's, it's just amazing. But when she came into camp, it was really cute. You know, she'd never been in a trailer before, so they had to train her to get into the trailer. They put her through hoof camp, which is the equine version of boot camp. You know, and so she had to be taught to get down uh, and get under communication wire, step over things. And um, she got so good with the commands with her uh, partner, uh, Joe Latham, that was training her. He could give her hand signals and she would know what to do. And uh, from across the battlefield, which was really great because sometimes the noise was so bad the guys couldn't hear each other talk, let alone, you know, converse at any, at any distance. And so it really, uh, really was something. So they put her through, uh, they put her through hoof camp and taught her the things that she needed to know. And she needed to get to know English commands, you know, because there weren't any Koreans uh, there. Mm -hmm. So really, she was a very, very smart horse. And uh, it said that she only had to be told something once or twice and she got it down. So that's just amazing. She was really brave, you know, like yeah. out close Vegas, yeah, the five days and she going up the one day, I think in the book, it was what, 50 something times. She yeah, 51 times. Yeah, 51 that's times she made the trip. Most of the time by herself. Yeah. That's just amazing. That's, see that right there just by herself is incredible. And she's carrying ammunition up and bringing people down. Yeah, that's yeah. Crazy. It's hard. I know it's hard to know how many wounded she carried down. In my book, I have three verified instances, at least three, uh, of, of wounded or people seeing her carried wounded and, and all of that. But the fact that, and you would know more about this than I do, I had to find out about this to try to say, horses usually run from chaos. And this kind of chaos, when there was, especially with Outpost Vegas, and it was, it was called the most 
one of the most fierce battles in Marine Corps history at that time. And you think of the battles that you've seen during World War II or uh, Bella Wood, World War I, and to think that these battles were as fierce. I mean, the radar, this, there was so much incoming and outgoing, they were colliding midair and raining down on the troops. And the radar, they didn't know what was coming and what was going, it was just a blur. So for her to do this, and I, I asked, um, I asked some people what, why she did it. What did she do? I asked uh, Bob Miller, who's a horse uh, veterinarian out here. I said, why did she do that? And he said, the Marines became her herd and she would follow them anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so that was the whole thing. They, they took such care of her. She trusted them implicitly. She absolutely adored them. They adored her. And um, she was such a valuable part of the unit that they would throw their flak jackets over her to protect her when she would go up to the gun sites, you know, and, and uh, protect them from any kind of shrapnel or uh, ammunition that was coming at them. So it really was something else. But to think that in the Battle of Outpost Vegas, she made the 51 trips, she carried 386 rounds of ammunition on her back. That's over 9,000 pounds, Scott, you know, almost five tons, you know, yeah, a horse, you know, and um, she was wounded twice, um, got hit in the forehead and the left flank. She walked over 35 miles up and down the hills and across open rice paddies uh, in full view of the enemy fire. Um, and so it was just uh, amazing what she was able to do uh, in this battle. And uh, Boy, she, she really, uh, there's no wonder uh, a reason you can see why she was listed in Life Magazine as one of her all-time greatest heroes. Absolutely. So that would be two purple hearts, correct? Yes, she sure did. She got, yeah. she got everything that the men received, the Good Conduct Medal, uh, two purple hearts, everything that they got. And she is the only animal to hold an official ranking in any branch of the military. And eventually she was a staff sergeant, uh, but uh, in Korea she, she became a sergeant and she, the promotion was bestowed upon her on the battlefield by uh, General Rand McCall Pate, who later became the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And he was the one that pinned her staff sergeant stripes on her at Camp Pendleton. But, you know, some people say, well, Sergeant Stubby, the dog from World War I, you know, he was a sergeant. And I'm like, no, that's not an official rank that was kind of bestowed upon him right. from people that actually loved him or, you know, thought he deserved it and things like that. But uh, Reckless, Reckless actually held that rank. And if she outranked you, you could not lead her in a parade. And uh, it was really oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I, know. I know it's really cute. It, it really is, you know. So well, she earned her respect. That's for sure. But she did. She really did. And she she earned the love and respect of the men that she served with, and then went on to become this beloved figure that uh, they would bring out at parades or special events, and you know, let people see her and meet her and um, everything like that. And uh, it was just really cool. That's so cool. And you can just tell the, the people that served with her or have been around her or read the stories how much passion there is. Yes. And yeah. One of the funny things, all the serious stories of going up the hills, well, she ate everything, it seems. Oh, my gosh. I, Could you tell her about just kind of what she loved? Oh, my God. Okay. So, you know, she'd eaten the mess tent with them, right? She loved bacon and eggs. She'd chase it down with a cup of coffee. She'd eat Hershey bars. She she would eat anything and everything. She loved to drink beer, have a share of beer after a, a hard day's work or a, a very big mission. And, um, you know, the fact that this horse didn't colic is is just amazing. I mean, she even, she even ate at one point um, an ammo clip. And it loosened her teeth. Yeah, yeah, I can you I just can't believe that. And um, uh, and then she also, on <laughs> the trip home from Korea, when they were bringing her to America, she, um, she had lost her appetite because she got seasick and she was almost washed overboard. And uh, um, uh, once she gained her appetite, though, she ended up eating her blanket. And so, and the chevrons and the ribbons that were on the blanket. So they had just, men had to scramble when she landed to get an, another blanket made for her so she could meet her public, oh, you know, and, and I, I know, so <laughs> it's really kind of funny, but, uh, you know, she was just this uh, amazing character, really amazing yeah. character. 
definitely. Definitely just a brave hero kind of character. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's just not enough words to describe her. The stories are so, so great. And I'm so glad you found yeah. this and shared it. Oh, thank you. You know, it's been my honor to meet these men uh, that uh, were with her, you know, and to hear them tell their stories. Some of them didn't tell their stories for years. And the one uh, man in the book, uh, Art Sickler, he had never told his the story and he took care of her for over two years at Camp Pendleton. And he's the one that got her, you know, got her feet um, you know, her hooves fixed and he, 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 I don't know all the horse lingo, but he, he floated her teeth and he, he just had this beautiful spray that he would put on her for her coat to make it shiny. And he just took such good care of her. And, um, his daughter found some pictures on his desk one day and, uh, he started telling her about the story and she goes, Oh my gosh, let's Google it. Let's, let's just see what's going on. Well, they found me and he called me thankfully just a couple of months before i was sending my book to uh um uh, finishing up on my book and it was before the uh, dedication of the very first monument and so he called me and he gave me his stories and you could hear the crackle in all of these men when they would talk about her you could hear the crackle in their voice um, and when you talk with them in person, when they talk about her, their face gets red, the eyes well up with tears. Their love for this horse is palpable even today. And uh, that's, that's what makes this so special. And so to get their stories and then for them to send me their Polaroids that they had, or if the men had died like uh, Pedersen, Eric Pedersen had passed away and so had Joe Latham by the time I was writing my book, but I was able to reach out to their children and Joe Latham's daughter sent me all of her dad's pictures and all of these uh, all of these things and it was just such a blessing to you know go through these and touch them and uh, oh my gosh you know it's like it it was really truly blessed i'm truly very very blessed with that absolutely yeah, yeah. absolutely i just love it it's just it's history that you're bringing back to life and that's what's so important <laughs> the monuments i mean around the country correct i know right. there's one in fort worth at the cowgirl have you seen that one? I saw you were at the stockyards. No, uh, I didn't see it, but oh. I, I wasn't in that area, but I'm going to go back. Yeah, I'm there a lot. I'm going to make a special trip just to look. Oh, great. It's in between the Calgary Museum and the Dickies Museum, uh, the okay. Dickies Arena. It's right there at uh, and Alice Walton Park. And it's absolutely stunning. Uh, oh, she's just so gorgeous. And see, what I like to say about Reckless is she's an ambassador for all of those that served. And so by learning her story, you learn about the men that served with her. Absolutely. So the very fact that we have five monuments now, and one, the first one was at Quantico, Virginia, um, at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Uh, that was in 2013. Uh, in 2016, we put up Camp Pendleton, because that's where she lived out her days and is buried. Uh, the third one is at the Kentucky Horse Park in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, the fourth one is at a, uh, I've not seen it yet, but it's at a horse uh, farm in Barrington Hills, Illinois, that works with veterans with PTSD. And so she's a symbol for them uh, to, you know, uh, as a veteran herself to, because uh, she suffered from PTSD as well. Uh, and so that's a really cool one. And then the fifth one that we just did is, uh, it was at the National Cowgirl Museum in Fort Worth. So we have a sixth one that's going up at the World Equestrian Center sometime in 2021 in Ocala, Florida. So wow, congratulations. We're very, yeah, very, very excited, uh, excited about that one. And then maybe South Korea. We're working on South Korea as well. So um, uh, we're hopeful. So we'll see, you know. Absolutely. The store. But uh, so we have her kind of placed all around the country so people can find their closest one and go see her. And you know, there's a little bit of tail hair. I had some of Reckless's tail hair given to me by uh, a young, uh, she was just a child at the time when Reckless was there, but Debbie McCain took care of Reckless and uh, Reckless's Colts. Uh, Fearless, Dauntless, and Chesty. She knew Chesty as well. And Debbie had um, some of Reckless's uh, shoes, her horseshoes, and also some of her tail hair. So with each monument, I always stick at the last minute a little piece of some of her tail hair up there. So there's a little piece of Reckless at each one of Very them. Very cool. So, yeah, it, it just makes my heart feel good. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I love the fact that you started not knowing anything about it. Now it's spread across the yeah. country. And that's yeah. Well, the, the, the Cal, 
Cowboys and Indians did a beautiful article back in 2011. And when finally this hit, um, and this was two years before the monument came out, and uh, when it hit, suddenly my video that I had up on Reckless on, on my website went from 7,500 views to 75,000 in just a couple of days, you know? And so then all of a sudden, it's, it just started exploding all around. And so I was very, very blessed that, that Elizabeth McCall wrote that story and, uh, and I provided the pictures for it. And so that really launched Reckless back. And so suddenly people were able to they felt like I did. Why have we not heard about this horse? And I think I figured out the reason for that. Um, in my book, I talk about, um, there was a book written in 1955 by Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Gear. And Andrew Gear was a big um, author back in his day. And he was actually a commanding officer of the uh, second, um, let's see, the with the recoilless rifle platoon. He was one of the commanding officers of that platoon. So he saw Reckless and what she did. And he his books were like, uh, and he had movies made with John Wayne. Uh, yeah, Sands of Iwo Jima and Barrier Reef and all these books. He was a very prolific writer back in his day. Well, he wrote the very first book on Reckless and it came out in 1955. He actually wrote the very first article on Reckless that uh, got Reckless home. He, uh, it was written in 1954, it came out in April of 1954, and uh, it had a beautiful, the iconic picture of Reckless with Joe Latham on the, in, on the cover of the, the article. And at the end of it, the very few last few paragraphs, it talks about Reckless being stuck on the hills of Korea. And there was a national outcry to get her home. People sent letters to the Marine Corps, to the Department of Defense, you know, they, they said, get this horse home. So Andrew Gear, um, he had a friend who had a shipping line who called him up and said, my kids won't let me in the house if I don't do everything I can to get Reckless home. So if you can get her to Japan, I'll ship her for free. But you have to put up a stall in, in her feed and everything, but we'll ship her for free. So he put up $1,200 of his own money and they uh, got Reckless to Japan and uh, she landed in America on Marine Corps birthday on 1954, which was just amazing. But Andrew Gear was, was there. And so when she ate her blanket on the way home, you know, coming home, right? So he had to quickly scramble and get her another blanket. And so it's really cute. I have some pictures in my book. You see him trying to get the new blanket on her and pin her chevrons on her and all of this. So she could look really presentable at, at the, she was the belle of the ball that night. And um, so he was really her champion. He was her press agent. Um, he, he really wrote that first book. And then in 57, I think it was, he uh, had melanoma. Mm -hmm. And he died, uh, I think it's in 58 or 59. It's in my book, I can't remember when. And so she lost her person. She lost her press agent. She lost the one person that saw what her story was and did everything he could to make sure that her story was memorialized as best as he could. And had he lived, I guarantee you, there would have been a movie on her story. Right. Uh, but sadly, he, he passed away. So now it's fallen on my shoulders. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. As he went out there for sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves a good hero movie, especially when it's true. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, and you can no, make this so good movie, and it's, it's just an amazing yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. And, and the fact that she does come home, she comes home to America, and she lives out her days at Camp Pendleton, it's, it's just a, a wonderful, heroic story, you know. And so I, I, I feel confident that I'll find the right people to either do a series, TV series on her, or uh, a movie. They're out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully, fingers crossed. Absolutely. It's on the vision tree. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. I can do that for sure. For sure. Well, I love this story. I've told it to so many people since I knew you. Oh, it. thank you. Definitely. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait to have this out there just for people to see and, and yeah. learn even more about it. Yeah. Of course, yeah. people, it's been around forever, you know. They, they don't know these stories. And I know. I know. Re engages you with the horse, it, it makes you. Uh, it builds that passion back, you know? Right, right. In a different way. And because she was such a character, 
you know, yeah, she was such a character. She'd sleep in the men's tents at night, you know, and, and she, as I said, she loved to have a beer with them. Sometimes she'd have a few too many, you know, <laughs> like a good marine, you know, <laughs> but she, you know, one guy talks about uh, with the armistice, when the armistice was signed and they're all celebrating that he could still see her kind of walking sideways, you know, around camp because she had a few too many and, uh, but you know, God love her. You know, she she was uh, she wasn't a horse. She was a marine. You know, Absolutely. so her words were spoken. <laughs> Absolutely, she did her job for yes, sure. Yes, she did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the end of the show, we're gonna put all your contacts. When people want to, oh, thank you. The book and find out more information and and go to the website right. on Facebook. It's just great. The website is terrific. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, yeah COVID. I, I had time on my hands, so I just re uh, I just updated it. So it, it's it wonderful, good. and the pictures are great. They're so yeah. Amazing. yeah. Oh, I know. I and you know, GoDaddy has a really great little site that you know they make it easy to put these things up, and which to me was invaluable. So you just a picture says a thousand words, and it gets right. you identified. And and some of those pictures are in the book, and uh, a lot more a lot of more different ones are in the book. I have a, over 130 pictures in the I'm book. Over. Yeah, so it's really cool. So. Yeah. And you wrote a new book. I did. Yeah. We we're want to talk about animals. that. So World War II, we have the war dogs, we have the war horses. There's a few war horses in there. Uh, the war birds, the pigeons that were so amazing with what they were able to do. And there's even a war cat named Simon. But wow. uh, it, yeah, really cool stories. And and, and again, you know, um, these animals have inspired me uh, to want to uh, do a museum in their honor. And uh, it's, uh, my, I have a friend that's helping me with this, the International War Animals Museum, where you can come and learn the history of all these animals. And by learning their stories, you learn about the men and women that served with them and learn how, since the beginning of time with Hannibal and the elephants, you know, we've been using animals in some form or another in battle and so it's they're just amazing stories and um so we're very very excited about that and then last november we instituted a brand new medal of bravery for animals it's the animals and war and peace medal of bravery and uh, the ceremony was up on capitol hill in washington dc and members of Congress presented the medals to eight animals of course even though the korean war was the third war um, Sergeant Reckless got medal number one because I had some pull. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I wanted to name it the Sergeant Reckless Award, but I wanted her to get the award, and exactly. I didn't think that she could, so, <laughs> so <laughs> we were able to do that. So we're looking to possibly have this uh, a congressionally mandated medal, um, but if, if, that, if it never becomes that, that's okay. We're just pushing through and uh, and doing uh, honoring these animals that have served our country, the war birds and the dogs, even the dogs today uh, that are serving, so incredible. Um, it's, uh, it's just really, really cool. And I love giving talks, Scott, when I, I get up in the morning and I'm almost giddy because I know after I give a presentation, I, and I say this, I said, I guarantee everybody in this room is gonna walk out with a skip in their step and a smile on their face because they're going to learn about history through the eyes of these incredible animals. And it is so endearing because uh, I'm sure people that come to that are animal lovers in some way or fashion. And, uh, and it's true. They just, they just really get a joy out of learning these stories. And so um, I just feel very, very blessed, uh, uh, blessed to be a part of it and bring their stories uh, to the forefront. Well, we appreciate that so much. And their stories deserve to be heard. And Yeah, they and do. It's so entertaining. And it is, more than that, just inspirational. Yeah, they are. They're done and they really are. You know, they had no voice and they had no choice. And yet they served as heroically as the men and women that they were with. And uh, they would give it their all. And some people say, well, they're scared. You know, they don't, they don't have. And I'm like, no, they know they're, they perform because they know that's what their handler wants them to do, especially the dogs, you know, the birds that might be a little bit different, but still they home back to 
their uh, home loft uh, because they, they actually, they actually want to get back to their home loft because usually they have a mate that, that's waiting for them at the home loft. And seriously, this is true. I didn't know this about pigeons, but they mate for life. And what they did during World War II, this is, this is what I found out on my research, is they found that they could get a pigeon to fly faster home if right before they took the pigeon out of the loft, they introduced a new male pigeon <laughs> to oh the loft, seriously. They homed basically because they were jealous of this new man in, in their loft. And I just fell in love with that story. I just That's a it. great story. <laughs> get, get home with the wife. Got to get home with the wife. <laughs> uh, how funny. I know. I know. You can't make this stuff up. No, you know? I'm so glad you wrote it down and put it in a book so we can. Thank you. It. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it, it's well, fun. Really. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh, it has been a pleasure. It's so much fun. And, uh, you know, it's fun to talk to somebody who has a love of horses and animals and really digs the stuff. And, you know, it's, you just can talk all day about these things, you know, so. Absolutely. Well, I keep looking over your shoulder at, at that, at, at Sergeant Rick, it's going up that hill. Oh, yeah, that that's from my book cover. And yeah. I know yeah. I was about to close the show, but I keep looking at that. And can you imagine one day doing that 51 times? No, In no not time. with all this weight. Yeah in the middle of all this chaos. And uh, one of her handlers, Harold Wadley, who saw her in action on her most heroic day said, he said he saw her in the flare light of, it was like 4th of July, you know? And he said in the flare light, he could see this small struggling mare trying to get up the hill. He said, there must've been an angel riding the back of that horse that day for her to even make it down the hill. And uh, he never thought he'd see her again, and then he did. And he was just absolutely stunned that he that he did. But it's true. I think there was an angel on her back that day. What a great way to end the show! Thank you oh, so thanks. much. I want to thank well, God bless you. It was such great. a great great time visiting with you. You thank too. You so thank you so much. Absolutely. God bless. Take care, and hope to talk to you again soon. Definitely. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Scott.